Oakwood University. How you doing tonight? Are we excited? Welcome, welcome once again to the Dykes Rivers Lecture Series. I'm Victoria Joyner. Glad to be in the house with you today. Are you excited? Yes, we're excited this evening, but you know God first on Oakwood University's campus. Let's have a word of prayer as we get started on this wonderful evening. Let's bow. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love and kindness to us, for your tender mercies. We thank you for bringing this group together. We thank you for bringing Miss Alexander all the way from California safely today to be with us. We're so happy to be here at this occasion once again, Lord, and we ask that you would bless what happens here, that everything we do and say will be in your name's honor and glory. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Welcome, everybody. We want to say welcome to everyone who's come out this evening. We're so happy to have a packed house. Let's hear it for Oakwood. Yes. So, guys. Let's sit back, put your thinking caps on. We've got a dynamic person, a wonderful interview coming up. But first, this is being sponsored by the Oakwood University Communication Department. And our wonder, whoop, whoop, there's communicators, whoop. Yes, that's right. And our wonderful chair is here to tell us a little bit more about why we actually have this lecture series. Let's welcome Dr. Renee Elliott. Let's hear it for her. Good evening, everybody. You know, words have a way of evolving over time. And the words, the phrase, ivory tower, originally came from Song of Solomon, where it referred to someone's neck. It was a descriptor. And then later, it was referring to Mary, the mother of Jesus. By the 1800s, the mid-1800s, it meant a place where intellectual thought is totally divorced from reality. So you heard comments like, let them sit up there in their ivory towers. We all know what it's like in the real world. And it referred to higher education, to academia, the ivory tower. Well, I'm happy to report that at Oakwood University, specifically in the communication department, we do not live in an ivory tower. We are quite in touch with reality. Our students get a chance to learn the theories. Yeah, so they, they have the intellectual part, but they also get to practice what they've learned about. And so you see the studio around you. Beyond that, they get a chance to experience firsthand what communication and innovation are like when they're linked together. And we owe this to two men in particular, James Dykes and Ted Rivers. Dr. Dykes began the communication program at Oakwood. He also helped to establish WOCG, which you know now as? JOU, exactly. Ted Rivers, in addition to teaching classes at Oakwood, he started a low-frequency low radio station here on campus. And then beyond that, he started the Precious Memories music label, which gave artists like Take Six, like Brian McKnight, like Angela Brown, a chance to record their music. Ted Rivers is here with us tonight. Would you please give him a hand? <laughs> Ted, would you stand up? <laughs> Great. He said that he was sitting in the back so that he could be out of sight and no one would notice him. But he also said that he hoped that all of our students, communicators, aren't taking the facilities that you see here for granted. But that was the start. And so we named our lecture series after these two men, the Dykes Rivers Lecture Series. So I'd like to join with Dr. Joyner in welcoming you to the second installment of the Dykes River Lecture Series, the place where communication meets innovation. So let's get started. I know you're all anxious to see Ms. Alexander. I'd like to introduce you to our host for the evening. Our host is an alumnus of Oakwood's communication department, class of 1985. That's of 1985, and he's done much work as a broadcaster, as a documentary director, as a journalist. You may have seen, heard his works on NPR, 
You may have seen his columns in USA Today and various places. So he's done much work in the industry. Please join me in welcoming Mr. David Person. Oh, you need to fix it? Okay. And I hear a cell phone, so we will all check our cell phones and make sure they're on silent, right? No, that's not the, the mic thing. It's right here. Okay. So everybody knows who Erica Alexander is. I really don't need to introduce her, but just in case there are some who don't. Uh, if you remember watching the Cosby Show back in the 80s and 90s, you remember that there was this character who came onto the Cosby Show who didn't seem to quite fit in the family, right? And that character was Cousin Pam. Cousin Pam was played by Erica Alexander. And then if you fast forward a little bit, there was this really funny show, right? It had four black women, right? And, uh, and a couple of, couple of brothers that lived across the hall and they had all kinds of things going on, but it was a very cool issue-oriented show, right? Yeah. Living single. And who was Maxine? Erica Alexander was Maxine. Well, she's also done a lot of other great work, too. If you have Amazon, she is on uh, a series, at least she was last season, and I think she's on one episode this season, a series that's called Bosch. It's a great series on Amazon. If you have Amazon, check it out. And if you have the OWN Network, she is going to have a guest appearance on an upcoming episode of Queen Sugar, the new own show that Anna DuVernay is doing, which is a great show. If you haven't seen it, you ought to check it out. How's my mic, Jazz? Is she done? Oh, she's done. Okay, great. All right, so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, my friend Erica Alexander. No. Okay, thank you. You know what? I need to show my family this because they're not going to believe it. <laughs> they're like, yeah, yeah. This is beautiful. Thank you so much. Glad so to be good. Here, oh, David. it's great Thank to have you. you. Great to have you. Uh, there was a little bit of a challenge in getting here, but we got you here, right? Sure did. Thank yeah. you for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. It's a yeah. pleasure. And this is a beautiful facility. It's yeah. Everybody looking so great. So I'm, you know, I, I, I feel like I, I don't know. This is gorgeous. <laughs> Truly. Glad you like it. And uh, let's go ahead and get started. Okay. So um, for those who don't know, you have been, and I think everybody in this room knows, but there may be people who will be watching this who won't really know, you know, who you are and what the fuss is about. Okay. So uh, we've already talked a little bit about your work with The Cosby Show and also with uh, Living Single, and I mentioned Bosch and Queen Sugar. Okay. But what other things have you done as an actress in the industry? That's it. <laughs> he took, he did, gave you the entire resume, nothing, you know, that's it. You know, actually, I started in theater. Um, I was, um, I'll tell you a really quick story so you get a background of who I am and, uh, you know, what I've done. Um, my name is Erica Alexander, and um, I was born in the mountains of Arizona, in Winslow, Arizona. I was raised in Flagstaff, Arizona. I am one of six. Um, both my parents uh, were orphans. My father was an itinerant preacher. My, my mother was a, 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 yeah, 
itinerant preacher, my mother was a teacher, and we lived in Flagstaff, Arizona. And I did not start my career in Flagstaff, Arizona, but having a preacher father is the beginning of probably a lot of sh showbiz careers. Sure. And uh, eventually, my father, who had six kids, needed to go and make a better living than an itinerant preacher makes. I mean, obviously, you don't make that much money. You, you, you put up a tent, you might be on a reservation, you might be a visiting uh, pastor, and they take up a, a, a collection for you, and then they hand you an envelope at the end. And that's a very difficult uh, way to live. So eventually, he changed his denomination, which was Kojic, Church of God in Christ, Baptist, to Lutheran. And they sent him to the Lutheran Theological Seminary in Philadelphia. And it was there that I transferred schools. And in between that time, my mother uh, would typically give one of us each summer, um, she would pay for one of us to go to a, an extracurricular activity. And it was my turn. And she said, you know, I noticed in fourth grade you, 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 you did a play. And I was like, that's a long time ago. I'm in eighth grade now. You know, I'm a big girl. <laughs> I'm a big girl. And she said, well, there's this, you know, there's this theater. And, you know, you should, you should go there. So I said, sure. And it was a six-week program. And in the fifth week, a movie came to town. It was called My Little Girl. It was a Merchant Ivory film. And they told all of us that we should and should have to audition so we'd know what a real audition felt like. And we did. And hundreds of girls showed up because it was an open call in Philadelphia. And I am the girl that they chose. <laughs> so it started my film career. It's an independent film. Back in the day, there weren't so many. Um, it was even before Spike Lee started doing his. There were some. Uh, um, um, independent films, I'm sure, that were in maybe more mainstream white media, you know, mm -hmm. people do, but not so much in, in, the, in the black set. So uh, that's how I started my career. But because I was at that theater, I ended up doing some of their summer plays. Um, I ended up going to New York to work with Peter Brook and do the Mahabharata, which was a nine hour play that went around the world. I was um, also in, at a public theater. I did The Forbidden City with Joseph Papp. It was his last play. So I have, I've done six plays at the public as, an, as a, a performer and done a lot of TV and film. I'm a journey, I'm what's called a journeyman actress, where you might know me from a few shows and I might be famous to you, but for the most part, I sort of consistently work. I'm not necessarily the biggest celebrity, or the biggest star you may know, but I'm a consistent face. So to answer where I've been, I've probably been a lot of places, and a lot of people see me and go, aren't you? And, I, and I'll say, living single? They go, no. So and, you know, I really don't know what it is. <laughs> so I just stopped saying it, you know, because they might have seen Street Time, they might have seen NCIS, they might have seen, you know, all these things. And that's what the, that's what the business is, is to con continue to go and make a living for yourself. So those are the things that I've done. I've done, and I've, I've done a lot of things, but what I've, I think I'm most proud of is consi consistently made a living for myself since I was 15. Yeah. Uh, so I heard an interview uh, just this week where Jimmy Kimmel was talking about the changing nature of television and how the audiences are shrinking mm. and how much of the late night audience uh, is really, or the late night TV product really, is being driven by these viral video clips. Okay, I know that you do uh, some work with, and we're going to get into that in more detail later, but I know you do some work online as well, entrepreneurially. Uh, what, what, is, what do you see happening? I mean, he was saying that basically he anticipates, Jimmy Kimmel, he anticipates that uh, it won't be long before late night television will basically just sort of drift away, mm. you know, because of these viral videos and the impact the internet is having in digital media. What do you see? I think he's correct. I think we're seeing the end of television as we know it, the, tradition, the traditional television, but then everything is replaced by another thing. Um, when you have the world at your fingertips, which now everybody does, especially the young people, uh, they don't even watch TV, they watch their, they stream live, they stream whenever they want, they don't care whether it's Tuesday in Game of Thrones, they say, oh, I'll catch it on the weekend, or they might just sit down and watch it all at once. And I have to say that I'm glad I came before all that. Um, it would be very hard for me to catch an audience that knew my face if you had to go and watch Living Single on Thursday nights at 8 o'clock. Most people would not. 
unless you're Game of Thrones or one of the, the larger shows, you don't get that type of audience. So he's right. I, I, I don't know about late night. I think late night needs a transformation. It's mostly a white male game. Um, it would be nice to see a lot of other people have late night spots. And if they get it off of the internet or wherever, then it's to me it's appropriate that it changes. Mm -hmm. Um, since you brought up race, uh, let's, let's talk about that because um, I think you're right. There's a dynamic there that needs to be addressed, and especially for this young audience, mostly college students, many of whom aspire to be in media or in some other uh, industry in which they're going to have to deal with this, this question of race. Um, what's your challenge been as a black actress? I was talking to some of the students today, so if I repeat myself, please forgive me, because I have the same thoughts. But uh, <laughs> what I said that, you know, race for black person or any person of color is the background music to your career, so get used to it. Um, it's not going to change anytime soon, significantly so that it's going to suddenly be like, oh, nobody's judging me for race. I just went in and got the job. I don't think so. Um, but you know, we've always been that the type of, of, of people who not only survive but thrive in those situations. And we have to embrace it and not look at it as just um, a challenge, but also uh, you know, uh, perhaps how we can be successful with it. Because when you go outside the norm, you're able to create things that won't be created inside of you know, the, the paradigm that's already there. That's why we have Motown. That's why we have the entrepreneurs who are in rap. Um, that's why we have, frankly, gospel music the way it is. Mm -hmm. It's because, um, you know, there was obviously Mahalia Jackson, there was Marian Anderson, there was Andre Crouch, there was, you know, now you have all these different people and they're, each one, they're transforming it for themselves mm -hmm. and there's nobody to tell them no. Mm -hmm. And black people get told no all the time mm -hmm. and we go like this got it and then we go do something else because we've had to and it's it can be frustrating it's exhausting it's not fair and yet that's just how it is so i think that um if you see it like that and and, and i and i wish it was better and it is getting better it doesn't mean that things have changed enough for it to to change for you by the time you come um there's only a few huge stars there's will smith and there's uh denzel washington and now there's kevin hart and then you say, well, what about Chris Tucker? And yes, he's there too. But you see that just a few seem to hold, you know, hold weight. Mm -hmm. And then everybody, then there's everybody else circling around these huge planets. And then it goes outside like this. I'm somewhere out here. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm there. <laughs> and so are you, you know? So you find your orbit. Find your orbit. Nice, <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, you mentioned three black men who are leading stars mm -hmm. and, and who are, I guess, what we call uh, top bill stars. Uh, what about black women, though, in Hollywood? What's, uh, what, what, what's the state of things for black women in Hollywood? Well, hmm, you tell me. I mean, look, we have Viola Davis, who's seen as the epitome of dra dramatic actor. No one would probably say that she's a comedian, but she's the epitome of that. If you say there's a comedic actor or actress out there, you, you probably would, would, last time there was one that was, that was in contention was Whoopi Goldberg. Um, it doesn't seem to exist in the same way. Here's the problem. We have a lot of men, black men, who understand that and they always talk about black women are the most um, oppressed or you know, um, under, appreciated uh, whatever in mm. the showbiz, but they don't do much about it. Mm. 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 And they should. They have access to money. They have access to uh, the organization skills. They can go get pe people to do it. And we've done it for them. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Women do more than hold up half the sky. You know, and I think that we need to now call them on this and say, where are the opportunities that you're saying that we're not getting, especially when you have so much to have, I mean, so many opportunities. It's nice Kevin Rocky did another movie with The Rock. Why don't you go find a young black woman and source some material and let's do the Tina Fey thing for them. Mm -hmm. You know, there's Leslie Jones, people calling her a monkey. They were calling her all these things. Do I see Chris Rock and those type of people saying, let's get together and make that sister a franchise. 
you know, so she's not just waiting for Ghostbusters. And that's the problem, that's the issue, or the challenge is to say, listen, if you have access, or if you're doing better, if you're a rapper and you've got, you know, um, um, a way to, to, to make a way, then make a way for the sisters who made way for you. Keep it real, keep it real. Love it, love it, love it. All right, so I'm gonna ask you to keep it even a bit more real and recap something that you talked about earlier today with the communication students in, uh, in Professor Teresha King's class. You called out T.P. Tyler Perry. You called him out. Go on, go on. Well, <laughs> he just don't want me to work at all anymore, does he? <laughs> Look, I'm not here to, I, I don't want to be, you know, like the Grinch who stole uh, Christmas here. But there's a, a real dynamic that has to be talked about. I was talking, let me explain something really quickly. That I don't have a problem with whether I like the quality of his movies or mm -hmm. not. That's not for me to say. You know, I've, I've done all different types of movies and um, I try not to judge. I try to go in there and do the best work I can if that's the case. So that's not what this is about. I think, and many people don't know this, but I'm an activist, and I think a lot of black people are. If you're not, you should be one. Yeah. Because that's the quickest way to make change, is to be a change maker, yeah. and to stand up for what you believe. And after a while, um, suddenly it comes, it faces you. And I have been disappointed with what I hear, and I have to say alleged, so I don't get in too trouble, the type of working, he doesn't support, well, let's just say the writers on his first show went on strike because they mm. weren't being paid. It was a non-union town, Georgia is a mm -hmm. non-union state, and they, they didn't uh, share when he had all the uh, money for, um, from the first show. They were promised more and they didn't get it, and they had to sue or go on strike, excuse me, to go and get that. SAG, which is Screen Actors Guild, wouldn't cross it. And so they supported it, and eventually those writers got something. But that's not always the case. And we wonder how a person might build a, a, a fortune like that. And often it's on the backs of people who are not getting what they deserve. They're doing shows which um, you can get, a, usually it takes, it took Living Single five years to do 100 episodes. It takes them four months. So. What happens is you have crews that are doing three, four, or five shows sometime a week. Now an actor can get paid per show. It doesn't matter, you could do, you, if you hire me, I will get paid for that show. And maybe even sharing some residual. A crew member is getting paid for that week. So just because you can do something doesn't make it right. Also, how are you getting all those scripts made? And who are making those scripts? And there's allegedly, you know, some finagling that happens there. Now, I have to say, I'm glad he's doing well. But I think that you could do well slower if people, if you made sure that everybody could share in that. And I think that black people and people of color are often taken advantage of because we so want to break into the business. But it doesn't make it right. So that's my thing. And, um, you know, he, he, he knows my number. He knows to find me if he'd like to change it. <laughs> You know, or say, no, Erica, you've got that wrong. But until I hear different from who the people would have told me different, who would have experienced it directly, then I don't feel that I need to uh, prop up that type of system. Okay. Let's, uh, let's continue to talk about your activism. Uh, one thing that uh, you're definitely known for is that you rep hard for Hillary Clinton. I do. Yeah. I yeah. do. Unabashedly. I do. Yeah. In fact, you even my, got the. my button. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, your 2008 Hillary button. <laughs> so, um, activism is very important to you. You said that you think everybody should be, especially African Americans, you're yes. saying should be activists. Uh, what, uh, what particular areas really drive you in terms of activism? Um, well, I was raised by a very strong mother and um, a hardworking father. Uh, my father was a sickly man. Uh, he was a child preacher from six years of age. Mm. So you can imagine the, both being orphans, the way they had to come up. I admire people who put their money where their mouth is. And um, I like when you talk about something or when you, we have our leadership talk about things, but often they don't have the resume or to, pr to produce the results. 
I like, I, I don't need people to give me goosebumps when they speak. That's a bonus, but it's not necessary. If I want that, I can go to church or I can watch American Idol. <laughs> I need them to administrate and legislate. And I think that we, because we've had two amazing presidents back to back who were great orators, two of the greatest orators in American history, um, we hold people to a standard about how they should make us feel. And that's silly. Are they doing their job? And, are, and we can we hold them accountable? And what can they show us that proves this as such? It's important, thank you, for black people especially, because we, people keep telling us, let them come earn your vote. Don't just give it to them. And that's true. Mm -hmm. But if they do come earn your vote, then you should know that they have. And often we get our news from the news, which is a mistake. Because mm. that's not news, that's opinion. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't back the people who are doing the hard work because they're not showbiz. They're not in the space, but they're working hard. And they can show you they're working hard if you've paid attention. But no, what happens is we get this sort of uh, cacophony in, in this vacuum of silliness that we are holding people responsible for stuff that, that was put out there by people who hate us and hate them. And it just keeps circling around and we keep making the same mistakes. We only pay attention to presidential uh, politics, which is silly. We don't do the midterms. We don't do our local elections. So when a sheriff arrests you and the super school superintendent is on your back, that's a local weather problem. But they say, well, I'm not getting anything. Obama, this person, Clinton. Well, guess what? That's federal. We don't know how our politics work. I have a problem, frankly, with if you tell me how I was raised. We were told over and over again by people like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and James Baldwin to find out things for ourselves, to go and read newspapers, to hold ourselves accountable for how we get our information, and we don't do it. So we're left with, with no accountability for ourselves, and we put the accountability on everyone else to tell us things, and then when we're told wrongly, we, 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 we're walking around, you know, I, it's just, I just think that with Google in our hand, we need to figure out how to use it. You know, and I, and I also believe that we need to take responsibility and be accountable to defend the people who are out there doing the hard work and make, up, make sure we show up for them. And it really is important, by the way, to volunteer and to show up because then you have some, um, uh, a stake in the game and um, you can put some blood on the dance floor, you know? <laughs> All right. Got one more activism question for you and then I'm going to kick it to you so that you can kind of talk through okay. some of the things that you have been working on as a media entrepreneur. And again, for those students that are here who are communication students, media students, key in on this because uh, I believe as a media professional and I think you believe as, a, as an actress and, and as a, a media entrepreneur that this is, this is really where the trend is. This is where the trend is. So key in on her media entrepreneurship. But first, let me, uh, let me ask you one more activism question. Uh, how did you feel about the Oscar So White uh, deal and what uh, Will Smith and Jada Pinkett Smith and others did with the Oscars? Well, uh, Professor King brought up something. Is it Professor King? Yeah, Teresa King. There, Teresa King, thank you. Mm -hmm. She was talking about, um, I think, what Malcolm would call black nationalism, that we uh, maybe could create separate, you know, do our own thing and not depend on the, uh, the, uh, the institutions that, are, that exist to acknowledge us or validate us. And she's right about that. Um, I told her I was caught between both. I mean, I'd like to do that, but then I also do work in that system. Um, so to me, the Oscars so white, they always white. I don't know, uh, they were always white. Mm -hmm. um, I think people started to notice it more because we're trying to make sure that the future doesn't, you know, the future is different. But um, I mean, it's good that it happened. It's good that Chris Rock did his thing. I think he made a, a, a really funny show out of it. Um, and things have changed a bit. You're seeing much more, I mean, Lupita Nyong'o, they are in, uh, a new, you saw the little girl who plays chess. There's movies like that. Um, there's a lot of African talent coming over here from Idris Elba to uh, David O. O. Yellow O. Um, the competition is stiff. 
you know, I used to do an African accent, but now it's not happening. Because they have real Africans. They have real Africans. And, you know, it's killing me. Killing me, man. You know, we talk about the export and import of jobs. I'm like, woo, can I, can I get one? But um, <laughs> we have that. We have Ava DuVernay. We have different filmmakers. We have Ryan Coogler. I mean, we have a lot of things. And plus, because of that, with the niche markets exploding, you really have to go after a certain market. So diversity or inclusion or that type of thing is important. All I know is I think the professor was right, that you can't wait for anybody to validate you. You should act as if the Oscars don't exist, but have the quality of what Oscars ask from people. I think a lot of people go and they think they have better quality than they do, and they don't. The mm. stuff is awful. <laughs> and nobody tells them that. Nobody is qualified around them to tell them it's not they didn't want to be mean, but I think that if you want people to pay attention then from script to completed uh, project, you have to know what makes an Oscar a piece, an Oscar piece. And uh, I think that we're really excellent. When we learn how to do something, we do it well. Whether you're Tiger Woods, whether you're Serena Williams, whether you're Ava DuVernay, whether you're uh, you know, uh, Viola Davis. Um, but oftentimes, we go around and we wonder why we're not doing better. And I'll s it's usually because of the quality. We haven't learned what, we haven't learned the steps that go into it. Because nobody wants to sit there and write. Here I have a James Baldwin book. You should read a lot, all the time. You know, because BS in, BS out. But you know, you want to know what's good, you have to go and find people and then it, it comes into your brain. And after a while you'll, you'll start to, to it, it informs you. And um, if you only look at television, if you only look at the regurgitation of Avengers 1, Avengers 2, Fantastic 4, Fantastic 5, you know, no, it's good that you have a place like this to talk about the classics. There's something to be learned. It doesn't matter what color was in there. There's something to be learned from Scorsese. There's something to be learned from John Ford and those types of people. So Oscar's so white. Um, it's unfortunate, but I think it's changing. But I think that I think if you're a person of color, um, you should ignore all that and just go for your mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, beautiful. Mm -hmm. So one more time uh, for James Baldwin, Go Tell It on the Mountain, a classic. Classic. Let's see, how far have you gotten there? N not far. Uh, <laughs> all right, page 141. That's, that's pretty decent. Thank you. Right. That's <laughs> Didn't know I was being point. graded, but on a curve. <laughs> <laughs> on a curve. All right, so um, Jasmine, I think we got, are we doing the questions? How are we doing the questions, y'all? Amanda, Jasmine, somebody tell me, how are we doing questions? from the audience, how are we doing questions? So while they're checking on that, why don't you talk a okay. little bit about uh, your, your company, Concrete Park, mm -hmm. um, and also uh, the, the, uh, the graphic novel series that you have done through Concrete Park that has really uh, gotten, uh, had an impact in the comic book industry or the comic industry. And then let's talk also about your, uh, your web series with uh, your buddy Kim Cole. Okay. So um, I've had to expand my skill sets. Uh, it's been 30 something years, 33, now going on 34 years of being an actress. And I tried to learn different skills. The best one was writing because I didn't want to wait for the phone to ring. And um, I wanted to be able to create um, an, a project for myself and my friends or whatever. And uh, so when I was around 16 or so, I started to write. But it took me a long time to create the discipline to sit there because it wasn't something that came naturally to me. I didn't go to college. I would go in online, uh, well, when online came, but I would go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm that old. <laughs> it wasn't always there, y'all. Um, I would go to um, uh, story uh, seminars uh, at local universities, continuing education. I would buy books and try to learn how. Um, but I think the thing that I, Le was lastly learned was to sit there and complete things. I have the courage to complete things from beginning to end as opposed to getting bored and then starting something new. Mm -hmm. um, I also married a writer and he was, uh, he wrote Eraser. He's the first African American to write a movie that made over a hundred million dollars. Wow. And his name is Tony Perrier. Um, it was different to, to live with a writer because I saw that he would get up every day and go to his computer and he would set his butt in that chair mm -hmm. and he would write. Um, that was fascinating. Mm -hmm. I don't really think I know how it got done up to that point. Mm. Um, it seems something magical came to your pen, you'd be inspired. No, it's not inspiration, it's perspiration, and that's what works. Um, it was good for me to see it. So over time, 
uh, we started to do projects together to go around in Hollywood and pitch them. And we would pitch them and uh, sometime we could get to the door because maybe they knew me or him, but it didn't get any easier because Hollywood at that time didn't really make many uh, things of color and we were pitching usually uh, our, our TV shows had uh, the leads were color were of color. One of the things we went around pitching was a sci-fi series called Concrete Park. I made it up with my brother, uh, Tony, who has a background in art. He went to Brown University. Um, would make visuals for it at the time, just graph using his uh, computer. Uh, he, and um, we ended up having, we ended up s setting it up at UPN. At that time we called it the Underpaid Negro Network. <laughs> uh, it went under. <laughs> it was the United Paramount, Paramount Network. They mm -hmm. had Star Trek at the time. Yeah. And Star Trek got canceled. And this was going to be, believe it or not, the new Star Trek. So I have to give them a lot of credit because they were willing to take a chance. The problem is, that as the network went under, the, uh, the rights reverted back to us. And we took it out again. And we had an <coughs> interesting, this is a, there's a, it's important. Uh, I'm sorry to tell these long stories, but this is an important story. We had a meeting with. Uh, an executive who I can't say his name or where it was. Um, and we started to pitch it and he stopped us, the executive said. He says, uh, let me stop you right there. He says, black people don't like science fiction because they don't see themselves in the future. Wow. wow. And um, he told us this long story, wow. which the punchline was that they showed a film to a, an audience, a focus group, and a young man stayed afterwards and was just sitting there and they came from behind their boards. This is how he got his opinion. And they said, oh sir, is there anything you wanna say? And he said, yeah, I just wanna know, how'd that nigga get to Mars? <laughs> now we're listening to this person and uh, me, I was new to going around pitching, but Tony was not. He'd written for uh, Oliver Stone, Will Smith, Jerry Bruckheimer, all these people. So he said, let me stop you right there. He said, for black people, the past is painful, the present precarious, but the future is free. Mm -hmm. We always create in the future, because y'all didn't give us a space in the now. Mm -hmm. He said, by mm -hmm. the way, mm -hmm. you know, you may not know Octavia Butler or Samuel Delaney, right. but let me hip you right. to that. Right. And he said, so your future that you live in now were created by the space aliens, the black people, 13% that live in America, who created jazz, mm -hmm. blues, yeah. Mm -hmm. hip hop, yeah. all the stuff. He said, that future, you couldn't have imagined, yeah, but we did. Right. Then he said, by the way, the number one star, the, a science fiction star in the world is Will Smith. Mm -hmm. So dudes started getting mad now. <laughs> He's pushing our stuff all around, and Tony grabs us up and says, well, now you're calling my baby. He says, Erica, come on, let's go. Now we're walking out, and we're little, even though it sounds like we really had our stuff together, we were gobsmacked, and we were hurt. Because you know it's out there, but for somebody to put that right in your face, mm -hmm. Tell two black people, my husband was very light skinned, you can't tell he's black, but you know, two black people that they, what they do or don't like was a, a killer. Mm -hmm. So he said, forget it, I'm gonna draw it. He went home and taught himself after 50 how to draw comics. After 50, he drew a few panels and he sent it to Mike Richardson of Dark Horse. Now, for people who know comics, there's Marvel, there's DC, and there's Dark Horse. Dark Horse is creator owned. It was the first creator owned big sort of publishing house. He, he saw it, Mike Richardson got right back to us and said, I'd like to publish this, let's talk, let's talk. We got published and now we have a comic book called Concrete Park which we go around selling from Comic-Con to Comic-Con but that's how we got into comics, trying to sell a movie. Beautiful. That happens. Beautiful. So I'll show you a little bit about Concrete Park. Yeah. Um, like I said, Tony draws it, and he drew me. <laughs> there I am. Uh, I'm an actress, and yeah, now I, I write Concrete Park. And um, I taught myself how to build worlds. That's what we're talking about, the, 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 the ability to own your world, Professor. Concrete Park, is that's our trademark, and trademarks are important. If you're willing to create something, it's important for you to protect it. Sometimes you protect it visually by creating something. Ideas, anybody can have them, but sometime you get with an artist and you create the actual thing of the idea, and then it starts to be more than an idea, it starts to be a brand. This is Luca, and uh, she's one of our characters, and we say the future is free. That's where our, our motto, like boldly go, where no one's, that's what we told the, uh, the, uh, the guy, well that's our motto. 
and we take it around. There's Tony. I told you he looks very light skinned, and he is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he, draw, he drew Concrete Park, and he taught himself how to. We're professional storytellers with a huge story to tell. By the way, everybody's got a huge story to tell. African Americans do. It's the one thing that we don't do as much inside of Hollywood. We have our writers, Maya Angelou, uh, um, Toni Morrison, uh, Zadie Smith, you know, tons. But we need to start figuring out how they do that and how we can do it. Short films, all of that, it's worth learning. It's a very tough profession. We wanted to tell a story about the future and a story with people of color. So we did. And we thought our, our stories had the ability to change the world and shape the future, which if we want to be treated differently in the world, we see young men getting shot out on the street, uh, then you have to change how they look at you. That's called the, their dreamscape. They are afraid of us already. But how do we change that narrative? If we could have done it with music, it would have been done. Mm -hmm. We have to change the image. And that's where, that's the last, believe it or not, that's the last, boldly go. Yeah, well, we about to boldly go together. Now. <laughs> that's a man who wrote something that changed his whole world. I think if he had not written those two books, he would not be president. Mm -hmm. But he told his narrative or his story better than anybody had. And he was able to embody that. So never underestimate the power of a well-told story. And we chose a graphic novel because of the low cost. The future is free, especially if you do DIY labor, which we were. We were free labor to ourselves. It had an anti-slick aesthetic. Um, it wasn't manufactured. It was made by us, and it was published by us. And you can self-publish as well. Now, this is from February 22nd, 2016. The Annenberg, the US Annenberg uh, School of Com Communication said this, that the film studios are uh, inhabited by straight white boys club. And the researchers concluded that women, ethnic minorities, and gay, lesbian, and transgender people were excluded at all levels of the industry, thereby creating an epidemic of invisibility. That is the whiteout. Um, so this is where Concrete Park came from. I told you that story. There's the uh, studio exec telling us that, you know, black people don't like science fiction. And that was our look. <laughs> <laughs> And this was me, who had been in Deja Vu, that had sent Denzel back to the future, and Tony, who had written this sci-fi <laughs> kind of weird action movie, Eraser, that we didn't like, like science fiction. And that is verbatim dialogue up there. So this is when we got together and decided, you know what, what can we do? Now that's the beginning of things sometimes. When people say no to you, it's not the end, it's the beginning. It's what you do. It's how you recover. And black people recover all the time. And we had uh, inspiration from a horror, we think who told us, later for that fool. <laughs> Tell your story, make something you can own, like a graphic novel. And remember, the past is painful, the present precarious, but the future is free. Nice. So that's me. I got on the horn and I did a Mad Men episode as a warm up. Now this was something that I did to prove to that, um, was it, who's, who's not Anthony Weiner, but who's the, uh, the, the guy who did Mad Men? It's a Matthew, Matthew. Matthew, Matthew Weiner. Weiner yeah. He said that he mm -hmm. kind of, didn't use so many black people because he said they weren't really in, um, in uh, that Mad Men era, that the advertising mm -hmm. in New York, which was not true. Mm -hmm. So I, my father-in-law was a black sales, liquor salesman. So I put the two together and made a Mad Men script, and then I put it out on the internet for free for anybody to read, and it went viral. Ended up giving me, getting me a, uh, a, a literary agent in New York. People who did not know I wrote did, did know. You can go now and, and read it. It's a 60-page thing where I bring Don Draper to Harlem. Mm. And it's called uh, Uptown Saturday Night. And that was a shout out to that old, uh, yeah. you know, movie. Yeah, Bill Cosby yeah. and Sidney Poitier. Yeah. And he started to draw. Mm. That's Mike Richardson who gave us a shot. And then now we have Concrete Park. And we have volume one and volume two. And that's what's been happening. And why do we choose science fiction? Because science fiction is like 1984, a bright cold day in April and the clocks were striking 13. Anything can happen. So in this world where we're always put into stereotypes, we knew in, in, in uh, science fiction that no one could say that couldn't happen and certainly not to whomever you know, we wanted to, of color. So we did that and these were our influences, City of God. That's a it's great, great movie. movie. Yeah, Spanish great Harlem, movie. Benny Keith. There's a rose growing in Spanish Harlem. There's all wonderful uh, uh, types of influences around you that you can use. Rikers Island. That island is just off of the uh, island of Manhattan, and it's the biggest prison, um, I think, in the world. Mm. Um, um, and uh, all those little buildings you see in there are um, 
have tons of unfortunate uh, people of color in them. And uh, that was one of our inspirations. Also, the real grittiness of Cairo, Nairobi, Mexico City, Mumbai, Rio. We wanted those people in our um, mind. Of course, Beloved and all these wonderful, George R. R. Martin, Game of Thrones, making epics. How do you make an epic? We, we, uh, Charles Dickens, a great storyteller, the Fantastic Four, Jack Kirby, Frantz Fanon. The oppressed will always believe the worst about themselves, Frantz Fanon. I mean, he had a wonderful philosopher. And uh, we put all that into, you know, we talk about the boogie woogie of things, uh, how to, the, the negatives of black and white, what's not on the page. These are for all the, con the comic book people, how you draw things. These are, this just means the representations the flat area of, of Japanese art. Um, uh, Jaime Hernandez, Love of Rockets, for people who know that. This is what made this. This is part of Concrete Park. This is a page from Concrete Park. Beautiful, because doesn't that look like people you may know? <laughs> well, to us, that was the world. That's what, that was the invisible world we wanted to bring. Jack Kirby is the guy who did all those great superheroes, and he knew how to make things on the page explode. And it was important to figure out who these people are and how they did it, and to make sure that we knew who they were so we could have it uh, and understand it. That's another page from Concrete Park, one of our influences. So these are characters from that. And these are the types of characters we started to make. And again, Gauguin, all the influence we had. That's, uh, we even stole it straight out. Tony just said, boom. And that's a page from Concrete Park. That's Luca. So this is a big page from our story. And you see that the characters are you know, multicultural. Again, like the world we live in. Um, we even did a map. See, the map looks like an African headdress. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And if you look close enough, there's even a Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard on our planet. <laughs> Because there's always a Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. <laughs> so that's one of the colored pages, and we have all sorts of great characters. And my husband loves to draw voluptuous women, so that's what you get. <laughs> that's JD. She's one of our characters. She's act, that's her real self. That's her movie self. And in her movie self, she's been pulled to death and turned into a blonde, blue-eyed version of that. And that's one of the things to mark the mental sort of cycle that we go through. That it, in, our ver in our movie version of ourself, would we really look like we look? Or would we already have corrupted that? Hmm. So that's what happened. You know, more stuff, tons of stuff. So telling a story is tough. And we learned how to tell a story. And this was a, just a simple action is how to hook people, how to make it deeper, how to get a twist. That leads to an action and a cliffhanger, and then boom, you know, you, you keep telling the story. It's important how you tell stories. St stories are not just dialogue. A um, lot of black and white pages, you know, how to set up, that's with color. These are some of our covers from Concrete Park. Uh, he draws in a very John Wayne kind of you know, going across the plane. If you see their hands kind of barely touch, she's saying goodbye to him, but their hands are placed. All of that is figured out, believe it or not, to tell the story. There's so many ways to tell a story. And we have Asian people in our book. We talked about the whiteout. You know, that's what we were trying to combat when we created Concrete Park. We didn't want to be part of the whiteout, and we didn't want to be afraid of the dark, you know? We thought that the world and the galaxy was big, and the future is free. And so that's what we did. There you go. OK. Um, I know we need to go to some audience questions. And you can go to Paulette. Where, where is Paulette? Oh, here's Paulette. OK, so if you have a question. You can go to Paulette, and uh, she will prepare you to for that. Uh, one other thing we need to talk about is your web series with Kim Cole. We'll talk right, about they're that. gonna set up, and we're gonna just see one of the episodes. I did the web series with Kim Cole's called me one day and said, "We work really well together. We should do it again." <laughs> and I was like, 
sure, what are we gonna do? Well, we just go in my living room and we'll do that. I said, I'm not doing it in your living room. No offense, but I think they're gonna expect a little something more. We can do something better. Although, by the way, you should start where you're at. You know, I'm not saying the living room was, but I thought we could do better. Turns out YouTube was in my neighborhood. And YouTube, if you have a certain amount of users, has a facility kind of like this, not kind of, like this. And you can use it, you can book it. And so we booked a, a Saturday, we went in with our friends, and we did seven episodes. We got another friend, to, everybody worked <coughs> for free. Uh, we had enough money to feed people, get them there, and we did this thing, and it was called the BFF Chronicles. Um, and we did it, and we had a lot of fun, and it was our way of trying to engage and recognize that television as we knew it, you know, the one we grew up in was gone, and that we start to maybe engage with younger audiences and newer audiences online. So we created the BFF Chronicles, and we did it like that, and they're gonna show us a little bit of it. Yeah. We did a lot of fun stuff. We did like an ode to Black History Month, and we showed it, we did a Valentine's Day episode with T.C. Carson saying the My Funny Valentine with, that he did with Max. Uh, we just, we did silly stuff where we asked each other questions. Um, by the way, we talked about the barrier to entry being low. Sometimes that's very important for creativity. That means you can do it over and over again and it won't be so expensive. Um, and that's important because we can make our mistakes and get better as we go and learn. Do you feel like, while they're getting it set up, do you feel like there is room for you as an entrepreneur and as an actress to grow online with either BFF Chronicles or something else? Yes, you guys are lucky because that's the case. Um, that we didn't have that. We, uh, we had some video cams, but even then you had to have editing bays. You had to have, uh, I don't know, it was difficult to cut if you didn't know how to to do that in lessons. Nowadays, you can do things on your phone that, I don't know if you saw, there was a movie called Tangerine, done entirely on somebody's iPhone. Yeah, heard Go look at that, it. Netflix is great. Mm -hmm. I mean, if this is all you need, that and hard work and some, you know, some, a really good script, which you, sh again, over and over again, the material is important, and of course, who you end up I I collaborating with is important. Yeah. Um, you can do almost anything. So you have, uh, you've got this episode coming up on Queen Sugar. What else do you have coming up that people can kind of look out for? I'm on a series called Beyond, which is a science fiction series. It's on Freeform. That used to be ABC Family. For some reason, they changed it. So I'm on that. I'm on Bosch. I think you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. I'm on Last Man Standing. I'm hustling. If okay. you don't see me, that's when it means I'm working harder. Because when you see me, that means I got a job. <laughs> <laughs> So, All right, I, I think this must be set up, so All right. let's, let's check it out. So this is Black History Month, I think. And by the way, the guy who did my, uh, the, the theme song, uh, he, I, I met him in Alabama, Dothan, Alabama. Really? Yeah, we stayed friends wow. all the time. You know, a kind of a thing like this. We, we stayed friends, and he does the music for it. Nice. Uh-oh. I think I need them. Can y'all hear that? No. We need some, uh, we need some sound on the... TV. Okay, I think they're coming. They're coming out now. Anyway, his name is Rochester Johnson, and he did the music with his friend. And uh, she don't, they people, she okay. people like it. They want a, a ringtone. Nope. Still not there. <laughs> Can y'all hear? Can y'all hear that? I think we did. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> no. They're trying to sort it out. Tell me, I guess. Whose idea was to do this crazy thing? It was Kim Coles' idea. Okay. Yeah, I mean, she wanted to do it, and you know, I told her I would do it. I'm gonna run it back so they can. I think the television maybe had just has to be turned up. Was it her idea also that her wig would come off? <laughs> well, we were doing it, and she she said, make sure you attach it so it won't come out. And I said, no, don't attach it. Make sure it comes off. Because <laughs> I said, that's funny. And she goes, no, really, Erica? Why me? And I said, because, I said, because you, 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 at the time, you know, that was a, an extension. So mine couldn't come off. So it, was, it had to be you. <laughs> she says, I don't know if I want people to see me like that. I mean, I'm so, so vulnerable. I said, stop being silly. She's a comedian. And she's worried about how she looks. But sure enough, I knew that the, 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 her be, being so greedy for laughs that she would want to be the one. So sure enough, I said, we're not gonna tell the crew. It's just gonna come off. 
So actually, it, it, you can't really hear in the background, but when she does it, the crew cracks up because they're thinking, what the heck is going on? <laughs> and Kim is just going and going. And so it, it actually turned out. And funny, because when we went back to editing, the young man who edited it, edited it out. She said, well, her wig came off, and I didn't think you guys wanted that. I said, are you nuts? What's wrong with you? Don't you know that's the funny? So yeah, we, he, I had, to, we had to put it back in. And he said, I, you, that's not an outtake? I said, no, that's an intake. <laughs> <laughs> I think they got They it, did yeah. it? I think okay, so. let's see. No. <laughs> oh, man. No? And it won't work without music, unfortunately. So you may have to go online to see it. You, know, you can go online. You can hear. Oh, they say they can, but they really can't. Do I have a? Okay. We'll do the mic. All right. What, my mic? No, you got a handheld. Okay. Oh, to questions. Oh, you want to go to oh, questions? Okay, okay, well, we'll do that. All right, so amazing. is this a question here? Go right in. Uh oh, got mic issues. Got sound issues all over the place. <laughs> You know what I've been wondering, mm -hmm. you know, as we've been, as, and I'm not just since we've been here right now, but just throughout the days we've been talking, why don't you do stand-up? Have you ever thought about doing stand-up? Yes. Y'all want to kill me? <laughs> Haven't I done enough? I'm trying to draw, write, do it. You know, uh, it's, by the way, thank you. I appreciate it. It's uh, actually a great compliment. Yeah. Uh, Heck no. <laughs> I don't want to do it. I mean, I could do it. I, if I thought about it like a monologue, I could do it, because it is a monologue, but, I, but it, another skill set to learn. So maybe I'll play one for you on TV. Ah, How about that? OK. All right. All right. OK. Do we have audio yet? OK. Hello. Hello. My name is Shadonna Bell, and my question is, for someone who dreamed about being an actor, what would be your advice to get in the industry, just to break in, to find opportunities? What would you do just to start off? Uh, we talked about this a little today. You have to start where you are. Um, um, you're in a great place to start. There's all sorts of, I mean, look at this facility. There's things going on. That means there's students making things. And you should try to submit uh, or tell your friends who want to be actors who aren't part of the college to submit their headshots. And perhaps if they need people, they'll end up uh, going through and saying, hey, you know, can you do this or that? And be willing to um, uh, do uh, projects that are not probably going to pay you, but you can get great experience and hopefully good reel, a reel. A reel is something you make that in Hollywood you need. People don't come to see plays anymore or anything like I want you to do the monologue. They, they say, show me your reel. And usually it's just online and you, you know, send it to them and they'll decide whether they can take you on as a commercial agent or something like that. But it's really more important to get the experience, first of all, to figure out whether you want to still do it because it can be a real drag. <laughs> um, and also, if you still want to do it and you find it, it you, you're still um, enthusiastic about it, then you start to meet other people who are doing it, and it starts to pull you in. So uh, you should go on Backstage.com. There are local um, notices for commercials, um, movies that are filming in the area or just outside of your state that you should be aware of. And um, every now and then, you've got to give up some Saturdays or Sundays to things that to go and watch people do it too. Your, lo your, lo your local actors and theaters, you should support that. Um, you should, um, if, they are af if they have talks afterwards, see if you can stay there and, and listen and, and maybe approach the director or the, the creative director and say, is it possible that you ever see new actors? And, and maybe they don't, but maybe they have something to tell you about who does. Um, that's how you do it. It's, it's really a, 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 hus a hustle. And then I say, you have to be sharp and you have to, to be consistent, because it's the one career that doesn't really have a structure. You can't go and just get a degree and work. Like if you're an engineer, you can usually say, I can go and take that somewhere and mean something. That means nothing in Hollywood, mm. your degree. It's the beginning of you knowing something, but m most people working in the business, uh, many of them don't have any degree. Mm. Thank you. Mm. All right. Ah, Professor Ted Rivers. Yes, Ted. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> professor to me, <laughs> professor to me anyway. 
How you doing? First of all, I'd like to congratulate you for making it out of Flagstaff, Arizona. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think one of the reasons why Dave has started this is to get students interested about entrepreneurship in the media. Back when, you know, in the dark ages when David was in school, you know, we were teaching to get a job, okay? And uh, now a job may not be out there and some of us may not work well in a corporate setting anymore. We've got too many different ideas that we would like to do. What, while um, the students are here, what kind of areas do you think the students should go into course-wise other than communication that encourages or would help them to be better entrepreneurs? Entrepreneurs as yes. in, in, media. In, in media. In media. Or in music, because there are a lot of musicians here too, oh, I'm sure. Wow, that's a good question. Um, well, obviously marketing and branding, uh, that type of thing. Uh, history. Um, <laughs> I, I, I count a lot on the, the past and the things I've learned in literature, English, uh, being able to write well. You should really focus on uh, your writing skills, editing skills, because writing is one thing, but you should be able to edit it down into something that's, you know, people think that the first thing that they write is, is gold, and usually it isn't. Um, so you have to make sure that you edit it well and that's making its points, that it's, that's effective. Um, uh, public speaking or that type of thing. I don't know, how is that oratory? I think? Speech. Speech. Yeah, speech class. Yeah, yeah. speech class. Mm -hmm. If you're a director, take acting. I'm sure you guys tell them that. If you're an actor, take directing, things like that. Um, I also tell, think that people should uh, try to um, subscribe to a newspaper and read every day <laughs> the newspaper. Believe it or not, you know, if you go to play a lawyer, um, it shouldn't be the first time you've seen that word. <laughs> and you've got to learn that, you know, how you're speaking to your friends is most of the time is, is gonna be anathema to what's on that page. And that's what people fear. So if they start to slowly take things in, you, it won't be the first time. You'll say, oh, blah, 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 I was talking about that. Oh, you know, this writer writes this way. Hillary said this, uh, Barack Obama said that. Suddenly you can play a politician. You're hearing their thoughts through a writer, yes, but often, you know, quoted. And, and you know how it looks on the page. You know how it feels in your mouth. I mean, it's hard to, and you should read aloud if you can, read aloud. You know, um, that's a really important thing, to know the sound of your own voice so it doesn't scare you. Uh, that can be scary. So all those things, I mean, obviously anything. And I, and I actually believe that you should go and visit other people's rel religious places or schools and so you're not afraid or not, you're aware of everything. You know what being a Muslim is about or being a Buddhist, try meditation, all these things. Because you're an artist and an artist is communications. You have to communicate. Well, the first thing, you can communicate your own story, that's good, but can you understand someone else's? Mm -hmm. Then you can take it in and it goes through your filter un, as, as pure as it can be, because we all filter things. But I think that we need to make sure that our filters are not corrupting it with our judgments and our, oh, what's that? Oh, that's, <laughs> that's not Bible fed, is it? I, mean, I, I don't, you know, that, come on. We, we have to go in and be open-minded and, and have some fun a little bit and also travel. Oh my gosh, anything that can get you to travel. Please do. Yeah, travel. Hello, my name is Megan Cox, and I'm a senior broadcast journalism major. Um, I know that you spoke at the Democratic National Convention um, this past summer, and um, we're coming up on a very important election, and college students all around will make a difference with their support of either candidate. However, I notice a lot of students are I'm feeling stuck in the middle, not knowing whether to support, support either candidate or either they feel neither represents them well. And so my question is, what is your advice for students, um, especially at HBCUs, um, pertaining to their vote, um, the importance of their vote? Um, what advice would you give them um, as the election is coming up in making that decision? Okay. Um, 
this election is just not happening to you, you are happening to it. Get with that. You can sit out if you want to, but then don't complain. You need to happen to it. I do hold you accountable and responsible for finding out what the candidates stand for and whether they've done what they said. I actually happen to be a Hillary Clinton surrogate, so of course I know for sure that I, in good, in good faith, can tell you that she's an extraordinary public service of 40 years, and she's done extraordinary things, and she doesn't get the credit she deserves. But if you stand and deliver and you stand against a lot of the, the things that have happened in these many decades, and you stand for women, and you stand for uh, gays and transgendered. If you fight and you go to sec as State Department and you change that people can have on their passport something that matches their gender. If you go and fight for foster care children and adopted children and you change the law so now there's 80% more children in foster homes 15 years ago. If you get eight million children health care and all these things and you do it all the while, on some kitty pumps and some scrunchie in your head, they hate you too. <laughs> they hate her. So I'm saying that I believe that she's extraordinary like we believed Obama was extraordinary. Yet she does have a resume and results to prove it. Now I can say that and people who say, yeah, again, but I don't know. You can not know if you want to. <laughs> I don't know, I, 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 I'm kind of, I, I, I think this thing has gone on too long for me to be, uh, have any sort of balance. Because I've, just the other day, uh, uh, Sean Puffy Combs said that people should earn your vote and they should, you would, you would hold it until they come earn it. But what I didn't hear from him was that he didn't say whether or who had earned his. And she has earned our vote as far as I was concerned, and I thought that he had a responsibility to say something about what he had learned about it. To me, it was, he was asking for people to withhold something as if they hadn't for months been saying their policies and what they've done right. in debates and all these other things, and or could see real change. That Affordable Health Care Act didn't just show up, Obamacare, but there, before that was Hillary Care, Hillary Care in 96. It's important for us to know that. Why over and over again are we d asking for, again, our leaders to be better than we are, or more interested and curious? <laughs> so I have a problem with young people who have Google, who have streaming, who have all these things, who are still sitting on the fence like somebody needs to come and get them to live their lives. Okay. No, you do some work. Yeah. You have an obligation to do some work. You have an obligation to know. And more importantly, there are people out there working their butts off way before you even entered the world. And, and, I, and, I, and I think that we hold ourselves hostage to some kind of weird uh, uh, standard that people have already met several times. And we're the last one to give them the credit for it. So again, locally you need to know who stands for you and who's done the work, and you need to support them. And you need to know in the presidential race, because it is federal. But you, that person will not be able to do their job unless you do your job. And I think that, to me, over and over again, the millennials, not you, I'm not blaming you, but <laughs> the millennials can often seem like they're petulant children who haven't been convinced yet. Yeah. Well, convince yourself. Yeah. Do the work. Yeah. That's me. Hello. Hello. My name is Blake, and I'm a broadcast journalism major, and I'm a senior. And my question for you is in regards to the current Bill Cosby scandal. Mm -hmm. I know that you've worked with him in the past, obviously. You know maybe a little bit about his personality, but being that he is such a prominent black figure in the media and in Hollywood, what is your opinion on the issue and how the media is portraying him? Well, out of deference to the case and the women in it, I have not weighed in or said anything on it, and I probably won't now. It's not because I don't have an opinion. It's because if there's real um, lives at stake, and they should have, I think women lose their autonomy all the time, the, uh, the ability to speak for themselves. And um, he needs the ability to defend himself. And that's in a court of law, and it's happening right now. All I can say is that I hope that justice is served. Thank you. Before, um, before our next person asks, as a journalist, I have to follow up 
with, uh, with, uh, on that question with one that's not related to Bill Cosby, but related to Nate Parker. Mm. Now, we know that Nate Parker's movie is coming out here on Nat Turner. It, by all accounts, it's a brilliant movie, but because of some things in his past, an alleged rape, he says it wasn't rape, he says it was a consensual act. Um, you know, there's some controversy hanging over that movie. Do you have any, uh, do you have any thoughts you want to share about that? Well, all I know is this. Um, please be careful in life of your choices because they come up and <coughs> consequences come up. Good, bad, or ugly is not always fair. And like I said, I'm not here to draw uh, have a judgment about it. Um, I think he went to court, and that's what happened. But um, like I said, often women don't get believed. Both my mother and my sister were raped. I came to this town. City, you invited yeah. this that's city right. invited to talk you two about years rape. Ago, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, black women and women of color are raped all the time. They approach me all the time, begging that Hillary will be able to do something about it. I get Mexican, Latino women coming to me saying we clean these office buildings, they're huge, and we get raped in the night by the people, the, the men in them. What can she do to help? Having translators say that, I go to small towns in South Carolina where I have a woman who's studying to be a nurse and desperate to say, listen, I don't want anybody's pity, I don't want anything like that, but this is a small rural town and somebody came in at seven o'clock in the morning, kicked in my door and raped me, and then I went to court and because everybody knew him and it was a small town, they took him, they got him off. What can she do for us? What will, some, will somebody do something for us? This is a real thing. And I think that if you are a storyteller and the power of the pen or you have access to tell those stories, we need to start to tell them. Okay, so my name is Gabrielle Francis and I'm a freshman who's majoring in international studies and minoring in Spanish. Um, I read about um, you being a delegate being sent out to Africa, so I just wanted to know about your experience and like some advice for somebody who would like to do that as well. Thank you. Um, I'm glad everybody's so informed. It's actually <laughs> killing me. I'm in the hot seat. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, I was a delegate in 2008. Uh, President Clinton asked me to go to Africa with him. The Clinton Foundation comes up a lot nowadays, unfortunately, in a, in a bad way because they do amazing good. Let me just tell you, long story short, that I was asked to go there to look in on their initiatives. He, with his power and prestige, use, uses it to bring money to challenges or problems. So if there were this fresh water needed, he'll try to bring somebody who has the means to do it. And instead of just going through the governments, which can also be a very difficult thing to do. Um, and he's been a, very successful. One of the things that we went to go uh, check on with, he built 300 hospitals in the rural, in rural Ethiopia because women were having babies and dying. We don't think about childbirths as dying, but dying in, of childbirth and also passing AIDS on to their baby when they didn't have to. So uh, we saw many of those hospitals. We saw the farmers that they wanted to make sure that they didn't have to go through the middlemen that were charging onerous prices, that they could go straight to market to get them simple phones so they could know when the crops would come in and when, the, um, when it was time to bring them to the market. Simple things like that, like sunglasses to combat blindness in um, cataracts in these countries. That's what that was about. And there's amazing non-governmental organizations, non-government organizations doing that type of work. The Clinton Global Foundation was one of them. We don't know, but half of the world's population that gets AIDS medication gets it because of the Clinton Global Foundation. Hmm. Half. Hmm. This is the thing that they want, they think they can just shut down like it's a party. There's amazing work that uh, the, the Gates people are doing, that Zuckerberg is doing, that uh, Elon, uh, Elon Musk is mm -hmm. doing. There's wonderful people who have gotten a lot of money and they're doing great things with it. So if you have that drive and you're near even the CDC, which is in um, Atlanta, I know a few people there, they're the types of people who would love to see you. 
um, if you like to give yourself over to that and watch yourself. My sister went to Africa um, going to school and she got malaria and almost died twice. So it's difficult. It's a big choice. Not everybody wants to do it. Um, but there's, I think, more than any time since I think JFK started that program. Was it, who started the program of going out and doing well, that? Peace Corps, you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, the Peace Corps. Yeah, I think that was JFK, yeah. wasn't it? I think it was JFK. There's right? wonderful opportunities, yeah. and, and that's what I got to see. I got to see the work that's being done, that's constantly being done, but it's not being done. Uh, it's being done by a lot of people. Hundreds of people have given their lives to it, and I was glad to see it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Jasmine, where are you? Um, how much time do we have? Because you know, you know, just let's just keep it real. You know that people are going to want to do selfies and all of that, <laughs> and it's gonna, that's going to take time. And Erica's got an early flight to catch tomorrow. So I'm good. I'm having fun. So you know, I'll, 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 I'll take all your. Okay. I'll take all the selfies. Okay. We two have more. how many? Three, three more. more. Questions. Okay. Go right ahead. Is that me? Hi, my name is Nirvana Walton. And earlier you mentioned that you've been working consistently from a fairly early age. So how did your career positively or negatively affect your teenage and a young adult years? Hmm. Good question. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to be brief, but it actually is something that I've been thinking about lately, I think, is how, how did it affect me negatively or positive? positively? Positively, um, it's, it's easy when people know your name. That's just life. Um, it helps uh, that that uh, having my resume is, is a show that people have seen. Um, it also can be difficult because they can think that you're just in that box. And once you get on TV and people know you for that character, sometimes it's hard for them to break away for, from it. The good news was uh, the people who knew me as a dramatic actress didn't watch that show. <laughs> I don't know why, but they didn't. So many of the people never knew I was funny, and a lot of the people who knew I was funny never knew I was dramatic. Mm. So it's kind of weird. The weird thing about it, and, and I'm not telling my family, I love my family, was that uh, it, it isolated me. A lot of the people that I thought would be happy for me weren't. Mm. And um, I paid a price that I didn't know I could buy my way out of. It, the nicer you were, the, the more you say, oh, no, 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 you, here's, and uh, it, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not making this up, but it was really something that took me years to sort of get that sometimes it's, People just can player hate. That's a new phrase, player hating, but it's jealousy. Mm -hmm. And that can be very difficult for a young person if you don't understand why anybody would be jealous. I didn't even understand the concept because it was coming from my family mm -hmm. and, um, um, and friends. But I got new friends and my family came yeah. around. Yeah. 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 But that's difficult. Good evening, my name is Darcel Ford and I'm so past college, but <laughs> I'm asking this question on behalf of my daughter who's a little shy to ask you this question, who's in high school. Nice. <laughs> she is a huge comic fan, huge, nice. and she wants to start, have a career in animation. What could you tell her at this point to get a start in, uh, what should she do? Does she draw? She, uh, yes, she's an excellent drawer. She takes art classes on the side. We take art classes, that sort of thing. She's into animation, buying programs. So we just want to know what else could we do to help her further that career or that dream? Especially since you and your husband have started it. Mm -hmm. What did you tell her? Uh, she's doing the right, exact right thing. Mm -hmm. She should do more of it. Uh, that's how you get good at something. It's like playing an instrument. The more you play, the better. Um, if she's created, uh, is she here? Oh, can you stand up for me real quick? Oh, there you are. Stand up. Hi. <laughs> oh, that's sweet. <laughs> you need to get the mic because I'm going to ask you a question. Ask, I'm just going to ask you some questions. Can you give her the mic? I'm going to ask her some questions. <laughs> so what have you, so have you drawn something and did you do stuff online? My stuff is online on Instagram. And have family and friends seen it? Yes. Good. <laughs> Do you feel vulnerable when you show people your stuff or you're feeling okay? I feel okay. Sometimes I don't like, I usually don't like my art, so you Some know, people think it's good. That's good. You know, that's a pose. You need to get rid of that. <laughs> because not liking something 
is not a way to dis is a way often to distance yourself away from be held, being held responsible for it. You know, you need to be the first person to like it. Number one, it doesn't mean that you're finished growing. You you may be a perfectionist, but there's no such thing. You'll find that out later on. It's important to be proud of what you do because you can say, you know what, I did better. You can and you got to hold it up to what you did maybe six months ago to sort of have pride in it and then start to measure yourself against your own work, because you shouldn't measure yourself around the work that you're seeing. You're not going to be Mike Mignoli yet or Frank Miller. Not yet. You'll get there. So start to see that and see your progress and then be proud of it and say, wow, I really like that. And then once you start to see what you like, you're able to do more of it better. Um, here's why it's important that she answer these questions, because as you can see, she's already an artist. She's already putting it out there. It's already online. And even though your mother is so sweet and she, she's taking up for you, you know, the universe pushed us together so we could have this conversation. So next time I see you, you'll be like, hey, Erica, check this out. This is my comic book. And it's important, and I am proud of it. And I do love my work. So it's good. And we should encourage each other. Because I know how it feels. I often didn't watch myself act, and for a lot of reasons, it, 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 because, because I was uh, changing my performance to what I thought it should be, as opposed to sort of saying, well, it was the best I could that day, and I should embrace it and, and move on. Um, that can be protective in a way sometimes, but every now and then you got to look back so you can see how far you've come. So every, when I'm further away from things, I go look at it and say, you know what, that was, that was pretty good. I was open. Am I still that open? Am I still that? So always be the first one to give yourself props. And um, you, we should exchange information because um, my husband will be able to give you a lot more advice than me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Hello. Okay, last question. My name is Dr. Michelle Tenner. Um, remember it. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, first of all, I want to say thank you because when I was growing up, I wasn't allowed to watch like, you know, like the new TV that's like the regular TV now. Um, and my mom, like me and my sister watched you like living single and living color heavily. Um, so, but growing up, I always had women like you or, um, or women like Queen Latifah to look up to. And now we have women like Kim Kardashian. So what is your message to the young African American girls with the whole natural movement or the makeup, no makeup movement? What is, what is your message to them? It's a good movement. Um, embracing yourself is always a good movement. I think Kim Kardashian is a genius. And here's the thing. She is a genius. Here's the thing. I think that every time we look at something and we judge it, I think it's okay to judge it because you can say, ah, that's not really what I want. But then you have to ask yourself as an artist, why is it catching on? What has she done or brought to the table that's a legitimate thing that people are gravitating toward? And can I do that somewhere else? And I think her ability to sort of be very self-possessed and, you know, mm, is interesting because that's y'all's generation. So you may look and say, well, that's not me, but how many selfies have you taken? She just figured out a way to make money off of it. That's what's genius. And, and the other thing is that women for hundreds of years had nothing but their beauty to trade on. Mm. If you weren't from a rich family, you hoped to be pretty enough that some baker or some plumber or somebody, and we're just now marrying for love and all that nonsense. Because <laughs> it is nonsense. No, it isn't. I'm just kidding. But it's kind of not. But, but so the fact that she's now trading on her looks or her package or whatever and actually making money off of it as opposed to somebody owning it off of her is a great sort of declaration of woman power, however mm -hmm. you, you, you may see it. Now, you may see it as vacuous and shallow and you, you want more ideas to come out of her head, but as an entrepreneur, she's done something extraordinary. And she's not the first one. Marilyn Monroe did it, but Marilyn Monroe didn't own it. And you see how she went out. So if you can own your beauty and then get people to pay, uh, you know, to, to see you, you know, go for it or whatever she's doing, then, you, then, you, then you've created an interesting, you know, uh, 
paradigm or something. And, and I think that there's something to be duplicated. And by the way, there's a whole mess of people online, and you guys know it, who spend their whole time talking about how to do these twists and how to do the blah, blah, blah. And, and they've got hundreds of thousands, if not millions of looks and followers. And they're doing the same thing. The problem is, and this is frustrating for our people, that she can have a big butt, and she's getting glorified for it, and we had to minimize our butt for years. <laughs> so there's a little play of hate, and I wish, you know, there, there, uh, Angie Bassett's butt got a lot of play, but it didn't, <laughs> you know? I, I think that if now we're figuring out that twists matter and that type of thing, you should be figuring out who, how you can set up a channel and a distri distribution center for it, you know? And that's what I think the challenge is, is sort of looking in, looking beyond it, and sort of saying, why is this working, and can I, can I um, share in it, and, or how can I spin it so it is something that I like, you know, for young women or young women of color or whoever. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, I think it's about that time. But uh, I want to thank you for being thought-provoking. Yes. I want to thank you for being candid. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you for being generous. Oh, thank you. And I want to thank you for being here. Yes. Thank you. Erica <laughs> Alexander. Thank you. Thank you. Can I show this? Can I show it? Oh, the video. Oh, okay, it's, oh, it's, it's going to work. Oh, OK. OK, let's see. Okay, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the producers of this show apologize. This is an example of what not to do this Black History Month. Unfortunately, this bizarre, cliché display got by us. The on-air talent refused to show us this sketch. Trust us, they said. We're Black, they said. Yodley, jumping up and down and stomping around in circles, does not a tribal ceremony make. Dance, neither a zoo, <laughs> Three yards of cheap cotton print from the Crenshaw swap meet, a fistful of sage, and a wooden stick from Pier One Imports. <laughs> it is, in fact, the whackness. Did we not need two young men featured here and not even really Nigerian, but in fact hail from Las Vegas, Nevada? <laughs> this short month, do us all a favor. Post iconic portraits, featurettes, and Instagram tributes of African American leaders and accomplishments. But for God's sake, leave the dancing to experts. <laughs> come, y'all, but not today. <laughs> and that's the roots thing. They wouldn't know that, but. <laughs> You know that that's the root thing. Okay, <laughs> y'all, it's like I can't put anything at you. So there you go. That was that, and that's our crew to shoot, show you. There's a black crew. And there you go. And those are our music people from Alabama. <laughs> so that's that. I'm sorry, I can't do it from here. What about the? Oh, okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. Thank you. I have to say thank you for inviting me. I had so much fun. I didn't expect this, and I'll probably regret everything I said, but it's all good. It was worth it, and thank you so much for all the beautiful support. I see your beautiful young faces full of energy and passion and all sorts of goodness, and I hope that um, it, it, it keeps, um, keeps me lifted because it, it can get tiring. And I believe that these are the moments that um, the universe brings to me to tell me, uh, hey, you know, keep going. You don't have the right to be tired. So keep going. Mm. So thank you so much. Mm. All right.
As we close out, we want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Renee Elliott, who is the chairperson of the communication department thank for you. making this happen. Uh, we want to thank, of course, uh, President Pollard and his cabinet and all of the folks here at Oakwood University. also want to thank Anthony Perkins, who is the director of the media center here. And um, this has been a great, this has been a great way to continue the legacy of two of my professors, James Dykes and Ted Rivers, the late James Dykes and the living Ted Rivers. Uh, Ted Rivers, who's actually about to get married here pretty soon. Right? Oh, is he gone? Oh, okay. Well, he dipped out before he got to catch that. Okay. And thank you, David and Renee and everybody who invited me. Thank you, the communications department. Thank you, Oakwood University. Thank you. Thank you. It was an honor. I hope we get to work together again. Awesome. Let's do it. Awesome. Let's do it. All right. So, you know, this is Oakwood, and I know there's some protocol here. So who's doing the prayer? Because I know we got a prayer. Before prayer. Oh, before prayer. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I'm so excited to be able to do this. As the, um, the administrator here on duty and our president is not able to be here, but on behalf of the president and all of us in the administration, we want to say thank you so much for being here, oh, being you. a part of this day, inspiring our students, our alumni, our community. And so we do have some gifts for you from Oakwood University, but I have to show you the one thing that everyone wants you to make sure you wear. I love it. Thank you so much. Ooh. <laughs> Thank you. I love it. Oh, wow. This is great. I love it. Thank Oakwood you so swag. much. Oakwood swag. Okay. I'm about to put it on. That got to help me. <laughs> grab, grab the top of that. The bottom, yeah. I want my wig to. You look fine. You look fine. I'm good. I'm good. You look fine. You good? <laughs> Thank you. This All is right. great. It fits All too. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Shall we all stand for closing Thank you, kind Father, for your great gifts, for life itself, for the beauty of creativity, for your handmaiden who has shared that so freely this evening. And now we ask as we go our separate ways, that you'll be with us, that we'll make good use of this outpouring, that it can truly be used in so many forms and fashions, and that we'll be able to show at great length what you have given us. Thank you for these blessings, for life itself, for your goodness and love. Thank you, O oh Lord. Amen. 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 All right. Got it? Got it? Okay. That's it. Hey. Have such a good time. I'm so glad.